I'm here with Fernanda and Sonia, who are both our amazing ship content creators, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who they are and what they do. I'll start with Fernanda, who's closer. Hi. Um, so, yeah, my name is Fernanda Zulantay, and I was born and raised in El Salvador. So I'm a proud immigrant here in the U.S., and I'm a chemical engineer. Right now I'm working on my Ph.D. I, I work as a computational scientist at Yale, and I also create content, and I have to say, and I'm a mom of two. Wow. I have to say, because it's like part of the package deal. Of course, right? yeah. Yes. I feel like, sh what doesn't she do? You know? Yeah. Um, so I'm Sonita Macho, and I am a digital accessibility software engineer at Nike, and I'm also a content creator on the side. I went to Oregon State for computer science systems. I did an accelerated master's in computer science. I am fourth gen. Uh, Hispanic and my family's from Sinaloa but that is also like a huge part of my identity not feeling like Mexican enough and all of that and so I kind of use my platform to share different tips for Latinas in STEM but also just kind of like encourage others to embrace who they are. Yeah definitely and I want to say that I really identify with that because when people see me they don't necessarily think Hispanic a lot of sometimes people think oh this guy's Asian so mm -hmm. um, not feeling Hispanic enough I think is definitely something that um, we can struggle with at different yeah. times in our in our lives. Um, so, Fernanda, how did you get started in STEM? What was it that interested you in STEM and how did that journey begin for you? So, I feel like my answer is kind of basic because it's like in middle school, in high school, I started liking taking these physics classes, chemistry classes, you know, math classes. And I was good at it. So I started like, you know, when you're good at something and you like it at the same time, then you start like leaning towards that. And honestly, it turned out to be like one of my biggest passion. And I think it's super fun because it's like um, you literally at the beginning, it was like just curiosity of to find out how the world works. Like there were so yeah. many things that like you will explain to me the science behind it. And that was so cool to me. And now I, I'm able to have a career on that like this passion that I have. And I think that's super fun. Yeah, yeah definitely. And how about you? So I got started in engineering kind of against my will. <laughs> so I'm very blessed to have a sister. She's three years older than me. We went to the same high school, same college, and she was doing intro to engineering courses. And when you were a sophomore, you could take, take like your elective classes, like your fun classes, right? And all my friends were doing R101. And back in high school, if you were alone in a class, it was like social suicide. You know what I mean? So, of course, I wanted to sign up with them, but my mom sat me down and she was like, you know, your sister, Selena, she took intro to engineering. I think you might really enjoy it as well. Like, you should try doing it. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be a nerd. I don't want to do that. I was <laughs> like, and to this day, like, look, I'm a very girly girl. I'm very, yeah. I embrace my femininity. And I was, you know, only what you see from the movies is like, nerd, exactly. geeks or whatever. And I was like, I don't want to be that. If you look like this, then you cannot like, be part you know, of like I can't it. be a girly girl. Yeah. I was on sure that I was captain of the tennis team, but I was like, oh, God. But I did it. And, you know, it was in robotics. I was on the robotics team. And so I kind of against my will, I found my passion. I, like, bless my mom. I'm so grateful for her pushing me into that. Um, and then when it came time to, like, choose my major in STEM, it was just kind of like, well, I've been doing computer science for two years already in high school. Like, let's keep this train going, you know? So yeah. that's kind of how I fell into engineering, I guess, or was pushed into it, I guess you could say. Just shoved <laughs> in the moving train yeah, of engineering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. So um, you guys touched on a point that is really, I think, important. Females in STEM, right? You run into a lot of issues where most people don't look like both of you look. Um, how have you overcome that throughout your careers? Let me start with you think that yes I got a, a lot of that in undergrad I remember when people used to ask me oh what's your major because like when you meet people in undergrad it's just like oh what's your name what's your major yeah. you know and I would say engineer and I was like oh I didn't think that like yeah. I thought you were like communications or marketing yeah. you know because it's like you're like more creative right and you're like showing that fun creative um, side of you um, but, you know, it was fun for me and this is like the way that I express myself and I always like it. And I, I met other people that they have told me that because they went into engineering, they hit that side of themselves. Yeah. And uh, even after that, they started like doing their nails or like choosing the, the clothes that they like. And I was surprised because I feel like I was always comfortable with that side and I use it as you know, to be creative, but also I feel better when I dress up, you know, and it's okay if you don't. I'm just saying like, this is something that I like. It makes me feel better. 
So even though always people looked at it wrong or like they will always say, think like, oh, maybe then she's not smart, you know? Right. Because she looks like that. And I still get that. But it's like, no, like, you know, Google my name, come to the class with me. Like, you're going to know that I really like what I'm doing. And it's not like I'm like super smart, but I'm just saying like, you can do both, you yeah. know? I mean, what I'm saying is like, you can be good. And at the same time, you can express yourself whatever way you want. You don't have to be like a mold part of them. Totally. I feel like in high school, I, I remember vividly like walking into computer class and then like, it's always in the face. People are like, what? Like, you're in this class? And I'm like, and I remember at first being like, okay, I don't know if that's a compliment or like a diss. And so I used it as like a fire under me, like motivation to be like, I'm going to embrace who I am and I'm not going to hide that or conform to anything. I'm going to be who I am and comfortable in my skin, but also be like a badass engineer who is not afraid to be smart and whatever. Because I definitely grew up in the era of like, you know, movies. It was like, oh my gosh, I'm so dumb. Like, help me, you know? And it was like, yeah, that was like cool, you know? Yeah. So, and I'm like very happy to see that in the media that's definitely changed now. Yeah. Um, we're prioritizing different things other than just like looks and things. So, yeah, to me, I use it as motivation, and I just kind of, like, remember, like, Elle Woods and things, like, other kind of, like, characters yeah. who are, you know, able to kind of do it all and break those stereotypes, and so, yeah, that's how we... Because like, nobody's asking the other people, like, oh, why are you just wearing that sweater? Yeah. You know? Yeah, Definitely. Uh, I do appreciate both of your guys' strength, um, the fact that you're able to push against the mold, because I think the easy, quote-unquote, easy thing to do is to say, well, I'm not going to be myself because it's going to be weird or I'm going to be different or I'm going to stand out too much. And the fact that yeah. both of you are like, no, this is part of who I am. Mm -hmm. This is who I want to display myself as. And that you were willing to go against the grain to to show that and keep that your personality evident yeah. is, is really powerful and important. And I think it's like part of also like your personality. And that's why like I like talking about this because maybe it was easier for me and for you because we're yeah. like very extra and like we have strong personalities yeah. and we just like somebody wants to change us. But we're like, no, but this is what I like. <laughs> like even my family will tell me things about how I dress sometimes. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, are you wearing that jacket? And I'm like, I love it. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but I love it. So to show it to other people that maybe they have other personalities and like, yeah. it's like, no, just do it. Like we, we get the same backlash. You know? Yeah. 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 And, and you guys have that from the perspective of not only women, but also Hispanics, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, and I was just talking to somebody uh, previously to this interview that said that he would hide the fact that he liked uh, Los Tigres del Norte, right? And <laughs> yeah. it's just because like everyone around him at that time was listening to you know, Nirvana and yeah. all these like different, you know, bands that were not Hispanic. And so, you know, you kind of feel a little bit of shame, you know, bringing that part out, especially because as we know, engineering is, has been traditionally very homogenous. It's, it's just, you know, one kind of person, yeah. <laughs> you know, from one kind of place. And now that we're starting to introduce that diversity is that, you know, gives us the opportunity to share our culture, who we are and not have to fit into that mold. So props to you both. I think that's it. Thank speaks you. a lot to your to your strengths, so for sure. So you went through it in college, and then there was the period of time where you really have to decide, what am I going to do with this degree, right? So how did you both decide that, and what was your first step after graduating? So I went straight from undergrad to graduate school, and the, honestly, I feel like a lot of people that I met, and especially people that are thinking about, you know, getting a degree and getting a job, they plan a lot. And I feel like I'd be just living life for me. Like, I'd be, like, going with the flow and, like, I just love what I'm doing and, like, finding these opportunities. And things have just connected in a way, you know. So um, when I was in undergrad, I did research opportunities and... During that time, I found out what a PhD was. And by doing the research, I realized that this is something that I'm interested in. So that's why I decided to pursue my PhD after. And, you know, when I started, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. But as I went, I now I've been interested in entrepreneurship and startups. And it's something that, as I said, like I didn't think at the beginning, I'm just going with the flow and like whatever. I think it's interesting and I feel like I have a passion about it. That's that's how I go. That's great. That's great because I think a lot of people sometimes get into this mentality where it's like, it can't be fun. It can't yeah. be what I want it to be. It has to be a certain rigid, upsetting way a lot yeah. of times. And you know what? I'll tell you that it's 
yeah, like life <laughs> throws you thing things that you don't even imagine. Because like for me, like I came as an immigrant and I didn't know English. So like, you know, I was like in the middle of getting my engineering degree and then I had to come here and first I had to learn English. So I lost that time. So, you know, it's like life has throwing things at me. Then I had my son in during undergrad, another thing. And it's like, I keep getting this thing. And if I was stuck in one idea, like I had to be four years in college and then do this, like I will be sad all the time. You know, you just got to be, go with the flow sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Find some sort of fun in it because otherwise you're going to make yourself miserable. You're going to have the degree and then you're going to be like, I hate this and I don't know if I want to do this. So I'm glad that you're able to to be flexible with it and, and find, you know, joy in it. Yeah. So for me, like what I did after school, my journey after school is a little different because I was in the COVID era. So your traditional like junior year summer, you would normally have an internship and then that usually leads to a full-time offer. Because prior to college, I'd only ever worked at like Victoria's Secret or like a steakhouse as a server, you know? So I didn't have any like technical hands-on experience. Um, and so my junior year summer, COVID, everything got canceled. And so then I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to work in the real world. I've only been a student pretty much like the past like five years or whatever. Yeah. So um, then I applied for my accelerated master's. I had like three weeks to meet the deadline, but that would allow me to stay for one extra year and have that extra summer because I was like, I'm not ready for the industry. I don't know anything. And luckily I got in and that senior year summer is where I got an internship with Nike and from that, it, I feel like I have kind of a classic path in a way because I was able to get a return offer from my internship, right. but I also had to go through that little hiccup um, of junior year. First of all, Nike denied me my junior year, and I was heartbroken. Nordstrom denied me my a junior year. That was my other top two. And so, you know, I had to, like, go through some failures, but ultimately to get to where I am. So kind of like what you were saying, life throws at you different yeah. things. You have to be able to adapt and kind of just, I think, Growing up, we thought that, you know, four-year college and then boom, you're in industry. But, like, my sister did five years in, in mechanical engineering. And it's, like, you're trying to learn, like, that not every path is this perfect four years and then call, you know, yeah. industry. And I find that a lot in my one-on-ones at Nike. I ask people, like, hey, like, how did you get to Nike? And the paths that people take to get into corporate at Nike is insane. Like, there's so many different stories. And I think that ultimately sharing ours is what really helps other people understand that, like, they can get to a point of where we are as well. Like they, everyone can do it, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I do appreciate that you you really didn't take that no and keep it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I feel like a lot of people do uh, make that mistake mm -hmm. where they, they, they apply to a company, whether it's an internship or even a position, they get denied and they say, well, I can never work for that company, I guess. Right. But that's not true, yeah. right? Like just because somebody says no the first time, the companies, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't apply again for yeah. a different position. It could be a different hiring manager. It could be a position that you're better suited for. Yeah. And so being able to, you know, try again and keep up that persistence is really important in a professional yeah. career. So yes. definitely glad that you did and that. And one thing that I really love that you said, and I think it's important to remember, it's like when you said that you use that as an opportunity because like yeah. you learn how the interview process was because yeah. at Nike, you say it was like very different yeah, than I other mean, companies. Yeah, so I think kind of back to what I was saying, how I got into engineering, instead of using this failure as a way to bring me down, I used it as like a fire underneath me to just motivate me because I was able to reflect and be like, I know what I did wrong. I didn't study at all for the interview. I thought I was just going to be a shoo-in. Right. So I think it's like, yeah, like you were saying, kind of like a part of life and it, it teaches you things. You get that experience. So, yeah. So how was the how were the two interviews different? The, your first interview where you got said no and the second one where you got accepted? So it was still the same amount of rounds of interviews. Actually, one had like five rounds, one had four. One of them, it was like a group interview and that was crazy because I had never, I don't know if you guys have done group interviews, but it was like, yeah. how do I how do I be a leader, but not like overly like arrogant or like, you yeah. know, and so that really taught me a lot of how to just communicate with people too. And I still use that skill. Like when I'm in large meetings, I'm like, and it's so-and-so, what do you think? You know, like really having that balance between like leadership, but also like bringing ideas to the table. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of behavioral at the beginning and then there was a technical, then the group interview and then like a final technical. And I think that something that people can take away though, is to not, um, neglect your behavioral skills, your soft skills, because even companies like Amazon, they've done away with like 
the three technical questions and now it's three behavioral because they anyone can learn how to be an engineer. But when you're in these settings at these big meetings, can you actually converse and like produce ideas? That's what the company wants. So I think that that's like a huge piece of advice for people out there is like don't neglect your soft skills because sometimes those are harder to build than your technical ones. Yeah, definitely. I was just saying this earlier is that sometimes people they're so good at their jobs, but they don't have those soft skills yeah. and nobody wants to work with them and it really hinders them professionally, yeah. Yeah. you know? So it's, it's really important. And I know they call them soft skills, but in reality, they're hard, yeah. It's, yeah. You know, yeah. it's hard to learn. So both of you, I'm sure experienced challenges. What is the challenge that you remember going through that you overcame? I think that there were many challenges that I got to overcome a, a, when I started because it was, I was coming from a low-income family. I'm a first-generation student. I didn't know how to speak English. I didn't have my family here. I only came with my older sister and we came to live with my dad, which I haven't lived with in like forever. Wow. And, and then in the middle of my undergrad, I had a baby. So I feel like there were a lot of challenges. And I feel like when you're in these situations, these situations bring what's inside of you. And they show me that I'm so resilient and hardworking person. And so I remember that many times I will cry when something happened, but I told myself one day like, okay, Fernanda, cry one night and the next day, just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that has helped me a lot that I just like keep doing it. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Sometimes people, you know, show me like, oh, there's this opportunity to do it when I apply. I apply without even thinking. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to figure out later. But I've seen that, that a lot of people, they think first like, oh, but what about these and these and this, you know? And I'm just like, yes, let's do it. <laughs> and then then when I'm in the situation, I'm like, what did I do? Okay, let's just, <laughs> let's just figure it out, right? right? So I think that a lot of it, and w then when you're in the situation, you realize that there's a way to do it. There, You just like figure out, it's like human nature, you just figure out. So um, above all these situations, it's like, okay, I didn't know English, but my first friends were all just Americans and I only spoke English or tried to speak English with them. I forced myself to like be out there. Yeah. Um, then with the, as a first generation student, I didn't have those opportunities, but I was like talking to a lot of people. They will tell me about opportunities. And I'm like, okay, let me apply to this. Whenever I was accepted, I did it. And that leads to a lot of connections. Like if I tell you about like, my whole journey, I'm like, okay, I went to these because it had a connection to this other step. Like this person right. knew this person, this person told me about this program. It's like so many connections and like networking, it's super helpful. And then finally, when I had my son, you know, there's this perspective in society that like, once you have uh, your kids, then that's it for your career, right? Right, you're done. <laughs> you're done. And this is, you know, what I thought at the beginning. And actually that summer, because I found out that I was pregnant on January and that summer I already had an opportunity to go to a Czech Republic. But at that moment I was going to be like seven months pregnant. And I just asked the person who was running the research thing. I asked them if I could go anyway. And they told me they were going to put me in a computational lab because I couldn't work in a regular lab. And I went and I was like seven months pregnant and I came back when I was eight months wow. <laughs> pregnant. And then, yes. <laughs> you almost had your child in the Czech Republic. Like, now that I think, I just didn't think about it. <laughs> now that I think about it, I'm like, what if I went to labor in the Czech Republic? Can you imagine that? <laughs> and then I had my son during like junior year of college during the semester. Some people told me like, oh, like you shouldn't do that. It's going to be hard. But like, you know, I just did it and because I knew that I wanted to graduate and I was like, I will figure out. And when I graduated during the pandemic, my son gave me my Aww, diploma. I have a so picture of that. I love yes. it. <laughs> You're so resilient. I guess so. Yeah. Well, I feel like for me, my biggest challenge through school and through like career is just my mental health. Honestly, I think in a lot of Latino households, you know, mental health, like so stigmatized, like, yeah. you know, and I'm very blessed that my parents both encouraged me to go to therapy, but when I mean my best, like I was the black sheep of the family. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I could totally tell. I think so I struggle with ADHD and when you have ADHD you also kind of have like anxiety and depression. The Holy Trinity. <laughs> yeah. 
So it's been a lot of like navigating that, especially when I was in school and then now being in corporate and having to like have certain accommodations and and kind of owning my own mental health, if that makes sense. Because for so long I can like suppress it or say that it doesn't affect the way that I work or whatever. But I've actually done like a VR study that did a cognitive test and I'm like, it just solidified the fact that I'm like, yeah, I have ADHD and I, right. you know, working like right next to people isn't the best thing for me. But I think that owning it and going to therapy and finding those resources. And I found all of my therapists on my own because, you know, I was like, I actually do need the help. And I think that that's scary for a lot of students and just people in general. It's like kind of admitting that, you know, maybe all the wires aren't perfectly <laughs> aligned and that, you know, there there's other options out there. So I think that that's one of my biggest struggles that I've had to deal with on top of like, you know, being a Latina in STEM and like just kind of like feeling like, Things are kind of stacked up against me and sometimes feeling like the whole world is against me, but um, trying to lift myself out of those thoughts, you know? Yeah, yeah. that would be so good. That is yeah. so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I do want to touch on a point that you mentioned, the stigma of uh, mental health issues within the Hispanic community. You yeah. know, I do think there's there's a misconception. It's like, oh, this person's seeing a therapist? Are they crazy? <laughs> like, what's wrong? You know, yeah. what's... Like, oh, tenemos que venderlo en el manicomio or something. And it's <laughs> no, just like, literally. yeah. And so, and, and it's it's a little bit sad because sometimes when you start going through your own mental health journey, yeah. then you start being able to tell like, man, my my parents need help. <laughs> you know? Oh or, my God. Right? Yes. And it's like that. Like, I need, like, I need to get my mom to see a therapist because <laughs> clearly she's, <laughs> she's repressed a lot of things. And yeah. Yeah. and, and it's, it's some of those hangups, I think, are the ones that kind of prevent people from growing sometimes. If yeah. you don't acknowledge that you have these mental health issues or, or weaknesses, then you're not able to work through them, mm -hmm. you know? And like you said, like you are able to grow and do your job better because you've acknowledged them and you know what triggers it, right? Yeah. And and how to deal with it and how to manage it. And, totally. and I think that's great because, um, you know, especially nowadays, I'm like, who doesn't have anxiety or right. some sort of anxiety? Like, the world is so messed up yeah. and, yeah, you know, know, everything moves like a mile a minute. Yeah, we exactly. consume content. Like I saw something that was like, we consume content. We can see like someone literally dying and then the next one is like a puppy meme and then it's like oh yes yeah. vacation spots and it's like our brains don't have time to process certain emotions and i think that that attributes to why we all are the way that we are <laughs> yeah 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 definitely um so both of you are content creators why don't you tell me how you guys got started with that so um for me i love doing volunteering when i was in undergrad and then i had my son as i said during my junior year of college and so I couldn't go out that much. And then I will see like all these beauty influencers and fashion influencers because I, I feel like that was like the thing before at the beginning. And now we have like very diverse type of content creators. And so I really like that, but I was like, okay, but how can I do it in a way, do it, sharing things that I wanna share? And it's kind of like, you know, by trial and error, I found that sharing about doing like the volunteering work, but online as a content creator was um, really helpful for me. Like I really like to do that. And at the same time, I was doing what I wanted to do, but in, in online, right? And then the other thing is that when I found out that I was pregnant, I was like thinking, okay, I don't know other student moms. Like, is this possible? What can I do? And like the first thing that I did is I went to YouTube and I was like, student mom, like who else is doing it? And at that moment, I didn't find many videos. Wow. Yeah, but so like you see, it's like, I feel like a lot of people nowadays use social media to search yeah. and to like see if like somebody's doing it, like how did they do it? How can I do it? Um, so I thought that showcasing my life as a mom and like sharing as I go was also gonna be helpful for other students and then I saw that they were very receptive. A lot of people were very receptive about these things and they came with their own questions. And then that just like drive me to um, deliver more more content. Right. And then we got, like I got um, brand partnerships and opportunities to be a speaker. And then I made a lot of good connections and I'm like, okay, this can be like my side hustle too. You yeah. know? I'm like doing like volunteering and making money and also making friends yeah. along the way. So yes. That's amazing. It's been a journey. I So my situation, like I mentioned, my sister Selena, she went to college with me. And so I had a built-in best friend. I feel like, yeah, I had some struggles, but like she was my like light at the end of the tunnel. She always let me know that it was going to be okay. The minute that she graduated, I was like, how do I reserve a study room at the library? Like, how do I do the printing? <laughs> and I was like, 
And I had always kind of like had this idea of wanting to be on social media. In high school, I won the award most likely to have a reality show. Hey. <laughs> so I always like had that kind of like personality. And I actually did the same thing. I would like YouTube, like Latina in computer science, nothing. And so, like I said, the minute that my sister graduated, I was like, I need to be that big sister to other people who go through this feeling from the get go when they get to college, you know? Cause I was already like a junior when I started content creating. And um, yeah, it just kind of started with the passion of me taking pictures uh, with my laptop and being like, here's 10 tips of how to study. And also just sharing like my journey as a Latina and things that came along with that. And then YouTube, I would do like coding tutorials cause I was a teaching assistant. And then saw a lot of the girls were struggling with the same concepts. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to make like resources and just give it to the students, you know? And so it was very, like you said, people were receptive to it, it went really well. And then from that content creation, I started doing brand deals and like having trips and getting all these opportunities that I was like, my office depot is paying me. Like, you know what I mean? Like I've always bought my, you know, supplies from them. So <laughs> it's kind of like a full circle moment with content creation on all of that. But it was definitely tough at the beginning. Like, you know, people would make group chats about me being like, oh, what does she think she's doing? Like, post, like, posing with her laptop, she's so corny. And I'm like, yeah, but also, like, the messages that we get from people being like, I've seen your content. And even talking to people here, you know, they're like, I went into engineering because of you or something. And it's just like, as long as we're changing people's lives, like, little by little, that's all the I feel like content creation is the goal, you know? The goal yes. of it, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's really inspiring because I do think that and I do myself go through that where sometimes I'm like, I'd like to make a video about this, but also like I don't want to be like pointing a phone at myself and what are people going to think, right? Uh, yeah, perceived. Yeah, but that's yeah. the thing. Like, you know, it, it shouldn't matter, yeah. right? Like you're doing your own thing yeah. and the other people... <laughs> and I want to clarify that it takes time to get to the point that you don't care. Because I do remember when I started, I would like hide, you know, I was like, my, my husband cannot hear me. My parents cannot hear me. Or like my, I don't want anybody to see me, you know, hear me. And now you see me everywhere. Like, and I would edit my photos heavily and just like some of the stuff I look back, I'm like, why are we talking like that or whatever? And now actually like a lot of the advice I give other content creators is like, once you start not caring the like about the presence that you have that's when things are really going to take off because then you're actually showing your real personality and yeah. people are actually going to want to resonate with you or like relate to you not this person that you're just putting like on this persona you know because that's also like so hard to upkeep like erasing every little pimple that you have like, if you did all your photos like it's just yeah, just be more really natural. Cool. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, my family used to make fun of me at the yeah. beginnings. Right. You know? And they were like, oh, my God, what are you doing? But now guess who asks when I get, like, PR, yeah. you know, like makeup or skincare yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 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 So it's worth it, I think. <laughs> totally. So what was the point when you were doing content creation where you looked and you're like, oh, man, I made it. Like, I think this is a real thing. I feel like. I have a problem, you know, that's true. <laughs> Let me tell we you. all have problems, but tell us about your problem. <laughs> I feel like I, I never feel like I made it. Yeah. I know that some, like I met other creators and I see like they think they made it, you know? <laughs> but like, I, I always feel like I'm working, you know, towards the goal. And because this was the thing that you know when I got accepted to Yale for example I was like when I get accepted this is it like I made in life I got accepted and I'm like okay was it that hard you know like I mean obviously it's not going to put any down things because I feel like there there has been like several things several times in my life where I think like okay like if I make it if if this happens then I feel like I made it but once it happens like for example when I applied to Yale I was like there's no way but if I do it that's it I made it in life but then like it happened and I was super excited about it but then I was like okay but like what's the next thing you know right. and then with content creation I remember and looking at people that had like a hundred thousand followers and I was like, wow, like they made it. Like this is it. But then I got a hundred thousand and two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. And then I'm like, okay, but like I'm the same person, you know? But I think I do like that, you know? I do like that because I feel like I keep working for other things and there's, you know, more things that you can work on and that you can achieve. But 
I think that last year that we came to the Shep conference, and I also went to another conference that it's called SACNAS. I don't know if you yeah. guys are familiar with it. People came to me and they told me, oh, are you Fernanda? Can we take a picture? Wow. And I was like, what? Yeah. Like, you want a picture yeah. for me? Like, I thought that was crazy, but at the same time, I was so happy to connect with followers in person and, you know, we talked about things. I was like, DM me, I want to connect with you. And I love that. So it was really nice to see that people were like following and they care and it was actually helping them. And as you mentioned several times that they come to you and they tell you like, oh, I did this because you said that or like, it just gave me the confidence. Yeah. And I like, this happened to me. Like I wasn't like following other content creators that inspired me, but like I saw people in like conferences, for example, there was this girl that I met that she was in grad school at yeah. MIT. And she, like, I will remember her up until this day. She was the reason why I applied to Yale because I was like, oh, there's another Latina and she's at MIT. I will apply just in case. Maybe I'm going to get it. So you see, like, seeing that representation helps. Yeah, totally. For me, I deal with a lot of imposter syndrome on this topic because out of the group that we're here with today, I have the lowest follower count. No. And, but the thing is, that's all number based, right? Yes. Yeah. And something I've always said, and this is even back in, in college when I started content creation and people were like, oh, you know, you don't have that many followers. I would say like, well, to me, the point of me starting content creation is helping one person. If the content I put out, as long as it reaches one person that it helps, that's, I I won. Like that was my goal. So to me, I feel like I don't have that moment of like, oh my gosh, I made it like necessarily. But like you were saying, I've made some of my best friends through social media back in Oregon. Oh, like, even, oh I thought there was another. No, back, yeah. no, back in Oregon too, but also the content <laughs> community, like, yeah. community. Like the way that I connect with you guys is like no other. And I was just telling someone. Like, because we met through Instagram. Yeah. We were working for Microsoft. Yeah. And like we all do such different things. We come from such different backgrounds. But we all like hang out and can vibe together. But also like what I was saying is just like. Another feeling of like, oh my gosh, I've made it is I remember at Oregon State when I very first started putting con putting out content, um, these girls at a SWE meeting, they were like, are you Sonia, like macho on Instagram? And I was like, yes, this only had like 2,000 followers. And so it's just kind of having those real life connections too, because people can DM you all they want to, but like meeting people in person, they're like, I follow you and like you have made an impact. It's just a whole nother feeling. And I think also the made it part two is like, working with these brands like we talked about like oh yes Amazon helped me furnish my home like my mm -hmm. apartment and I'm like that's that's unreal to me like, oh yeah no that that is true apartment. now that you say yeah. that yes I have worked also with like big brands like yeah. I mean the way I started with TikTok actually like they hired me to create to create education content when I didn't even have a TikTok mm -hmm. you know and and it's like this is insane you yeah. know and yeah, working with Pinch these friends. Moment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And also, but I wanted to say, yeah. you know, last year, because you always, you always think like, no, but I'm the one that has the least followers. Yeah. But you know what? Like, I mean, but you are, like, I'm so surprised because last year I remember you told me as Shab, you're like, Elio has his book and you know, like, Diana is doing this. Yeah. She felt like she wasn't doing anything. She was like, I'm going to work on a podcast. Yeah. And to me, it was so, like, I was so amazed that in one month, she figured everything out. Like she created yeah, equipment sponsor. Yeah. Like, I got figured it all out. Yeah. And she started her podcast and I'm like, damn, like you have made it. Every time you do stuff like that, you made it, yeah. you know? Cause it kind of goes back to like, once you meet that goal, it's like, what's next, you know? Yeah. And I think to finish off this, like this topic is like seeing, I don't know about you, but like for my mom, like when she sees me at these events or like certain PR that I get, just seeing the way that I can, like, you know, parents, like Hispanic moms, they're not going to tell you their problem. You can see it in their Yeah, parents. yeah. She's proud of me. And so I think that that is like, in my mind, I'm like, I have such a good side hustle that to me, that's making it as long as I'm making others around me proud too, you know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And you know what? I do want to talk about the stigma that sometimes comes with being an influencer slash content creator, because a lot of it is fluff, like mm -hmm. to be real, where it's kind of like, you know, this guy goes on screen and he like posts another video that somebody else made and he just laughs and it's yeah. like 5,000 million followers, yeah. you know? Whereas I do want to talk about the value of the content that you both create, where it's it's valuable, mm -hmm. deep content mixed with that fun part mm -hmm. of social media. 
you know, because both of you are incredibly smart and you've achieved a lot of great things. And the fact that you're out there helping other people on top of that, because you're using the social media as a force for good. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? You're not telling them like, hey, you know, this is how you get, you know, 10 tips that are unhealthy for you to lose body fat, you yeah. know, those yeah. types of things. And the yeah. fact that you're out there putting that positive information in the world, helping people like yourselves, because you you said it yourself, when you have that role model, somebody that looks like you, somebody that likes the same things that you do, and is achieving great things, that inspires people, totally. right? You know, it's like somebody might say like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I can be an engineer. Like, I love wearing pink all the time. You know, yeah. I love doing girly things. Like, I got my nails. But that that's not a point against them. You know, that's just a part of who they are and they can yeah. do whatever it is that they set their mind to. So yeah. I really want to say that I'm, I'm really, a, I admire both of you, um, the, you, the work that you've done. And I think that our listeners are going to really appreciate the fact that both of you uh, made the time to come on here on our podcast and share your stories because both of you are really a great example for, you know, our young members who are starting out and who might have a lot of these same issues that they're going through and might think, well, I'm doing engineering, so I can't do social media. Mm-hmm. That's also not true. You know, you yeah. can do both. And if they're both balance properly right you, yeah. you also stick with your studies and then you do the social media thing it's possible and yeah you're both proof of that thank you so thank much. you yeah. so thank you both fernanda and sonia for coming on the podcast we really loved having you and hopefully we can do this again sometime thank you thank you for giving us the space it was yes. great talking to you i love yeah. it and it threw you, and you. <laughs> and get together yeah so before we finish um why don't you tell people where they can find you and interact with you online yes you guys can find me as Fern Sulantai on TikTok and Instagram and then YouTube as Fernanda Sulantai. I'm Sonia underscore Macho, the short version of Camacho. And Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, it's Sonia Camacho. I'm not totally active there, but I do post my um, my podcast recordings there. And my podcast is Cuéntame con Sonia Camacho. It's short form content of different inspirational Latinos and I share their stories. Great. So check them out. And thanks again. One last time. Thank you. Yay. Yay. (laughs)